Well, doctors and patients, this is Dr. John Brimhall. And I have to tell you, this is like Christmas Eve for me to hear Gary Miller speak. Uh, he's going to be one of our homecoming speakers. And if you have not put this on your agenda, please put January 27th through 29th, 1917. I mean, <laughs> it's just unbelievable that uh, uh, we're, I mean, 2017, we're going backwards here in time to be sure and, and be there for us. We call our 2017 homecoming. And this will be the seminar of the decade for sure. And Gary is one of our main speakers. And he has introduced me to a concept of ketosis and ketogenics uh, above and beyond anything I ever learned in school. And he has me on the diet right now and on the product. And I really love it. So I'm going to turn the time over to Gary. We're going to try to save a little bit of time for questions at the end. You can write them in. And Aaron will go ahead and give those to us at the end. And I guarantee you're not going to stump Gary. All right, Gary. Take it away. Thanks, John. Uh, it was, it's a pleasure to uh, be on this uh, webinar with everybody. And I appreciate uh, meeting you, John. And the discussions we've had prior uh, to this webinar have been not only stimulating, but uh, educational as to what you're trying to accomplish. And my, uh, my hat is off to all of you out there that are trying to make this a better place to live for people. Um, just a little background. We are uh, Kegenics, and and we actually have been in this space for right now approximately three and a half years. We got introduced to this entire concept of ketones and ketosis, and the utilization of those uh, particular molecules for health back probably in 2012, but we essentially negotiated patents with uh, several different places, one of them being the University of South Florida, uh, one of the inventors of the technology that we use in our product by uh, Dr. Dominic Diagostino. But the, uh, the, the key is not, not to just have a technology, but what do you do with that technology when you get it? So it took us a, a little bit of time to develop a product from there one that uh, would in fact do what we wanted to do and and that particular uh, product would be to help people who really want to sustain and, and go into a, a healthy ketogenic lifestyle uh, could utilize this product to help them in a, a number of different ways. But tonight I, I think that before we get into the product which we'll do a little bit later I think it's important to kind of take a look at where we really have come from and kind of where are we going and so one of the things that that happens to us is we you know you go to different functions and you're sitting next to somebody and uh, <clears throat> one particular night um, I was sitting next to a, a couple and the lady turns to me and she says well Gary what what do you do and so I was thinking about that for a minute and the question is, uh, how am I going to answer the question? And when I answer that question generally and I say, well, hey, we make a dietary supplement that puts people into ketosis and, and actually is able to supply actual bioidentical ketones, whoever's sitting next to me then turns, of course, and resumes the conversation with whoever was next to them. So that night I decided I'm not going to do that. So I turned to her and I said, before I answer that question, would you mind if I just ask you a few questions? And she said, yeah, sure. So I asked her, you know, do you look as good as you want to look? Do you feel as good as you want to feel? Do you sleep as good as you want to sleep? And do you want to live longer? Well, she answered, no, I don't look as good as I want to look. No, I don't feel as good as I want to feel. No, I don't sleep as good as I want to sleep. And yes, I want to live longer. I said, so let me then introduce what we do. We actually help people do that. And the way we do that is that we actually get them back to doing something they haven't done for a long time, and that is burning fat for fuel. And at that point in time, she said, oh, I think I've heard about that. Um, 
my sister-in-law told me something about that. There's some kind of a diet, the paleo or something like that. And I said, the paleo? And she said, yeah, that's it. So it takes us back to asking ourselves, all along, have we really made the correct assumptions? And I love this quote by Jenny Young that says, making the wrong assumptions causes pain and suffering for everyone. And if we take a look at the world as it is today, and we take a look at the pain and suffering based on bad health, obesity, type 2 diabetes, and a number of these other chronic diseases, we probably made some wrong assumptions along the way that have caused a lot of people pain and suffering. I think we're going to kind of explore a little bit of that tonight as we go down and talk about uh, what ketones can do. I think all of you on this call probably know the body uh, possesses uh, two uh, engines in its mitochondria, one that can process carbs and glucose, the other can pr uh, process fats and ketones. And right now, I would say the majority of the people that we encounter are using the carb glucose engine and we are seeing, however, a much bigger trend of people starting to use the fat ketone engine. And that's kind of what we're here uh, to talk about tonight. So here's what's very interesting is maybe if we ask the right questions, maybe we can get the right answers. My question, after I'd studied this for three and a half years and, you know, obviously uh, it was challenging my science degrees for sure, is to ask the question, what should be the normal state of our energy production? And what should be the normal state of our energy storage? Seems like a simple question, but it seems like a question that we needed to ask about 60, 70 years ago. And so it brings up another interesting issue. So Let's take the carb and glucose engine. So if our primary source of energy was supposed to be carbs and glucose, then it brings up these really fascinating questions of, well, if that was supposed to be our primary fuel, why would it require a transport molecule, i.e. insulin, to get it into our cells? Furthermore, why would it why would that particular fuel produce 38% less ATP? And if that term is not familiar, it's adrenotriphosphate. That's the cellular energy that our mitochondria produce from macronutrients. Why would we select a fuel that produced 38% less? More importantly, why would we select a fuel that took 16 steps to produce instead of three? On top of that comes the question, why would we select a fuel that required more oxygen produce the same equivalent ATP? The other question though that really starts really getting to me is why would we select a fuel that produces 10 times more free radicals when it's burned? And then the last question is why in the world would we select a fuel that we can only effectively store 2,000 calories of? So just if you picture for a second a tanker truck, it's composed of two segments. One is the tractor part, the other is the, the trailer part. So in the tractor, you've got two small gas tanks or diesel tanks that hold maybe 100 gallons of diesel fuel. Behind you, you have a tanker that's holding 10,000 gallons of fuel. Why would you pick to make your system depend on the energy contained in those two small tanks instead of hooking the tractor directly to the trailer and taking advantage of using all 10,000 gallons. These particular questions really point to a very interesting uh, evidence and this is why I, I called on the theorem of Occam's razor that basically says simply when all else being equal the simplest explanation is generally the correct one. We firmly believe that our energy production process 
was really evolved around using fatty acids and ketones as primary energy source and in fact our storage process evolved around using glucose and insulin as our primary storage source and what's very interesting is they call insulin the fat storage hormone so as we start to see science move forward how did we get here so how did we get from a position where nature has programmed ourselves to a fat burning engine yet in fact we're using a sugar-based carb engine how did we get there I don't know if any of you saw the September 2016 article that was uh, uh, published by the New York Times but it was the uh, it was entitled how the sh sugar industry shifted the blame to fat so in order to make carbs and sugar really uh, the household name you had to blame somebody for the fact that America was getting fatter well let's see fatter fat Let, let's name that so I challenge everybody to read this article because it's just really amazing how much we got lied to over the last 60 years in terms of what's good for us and what's not good for us. If you want another interesting read is take a look at this science report that was published in the New York Daily and that was published just this last month in October and essentially what we might see happening we've all been around to see what happened with the tobacco industry all the lawsuits all the discoveries discoveries that were putting things into the tobacco to make it addictive I don't think we're too far afield from what's happened in the tobacco industry is going to happen in the sugar business I mean in the sugar industry is that we're gonna start seeing people held accountable for what's happened to our population and so who is kind of the architect of this? Well, it, it comes out that the sugar companies basically uh, bribed a number of, of scientists, one of them being Ansel Keys. And at the end of the day, I guess we can say a lot of things, but maybe the easiest things is he just lied. So you can see a chart here where it shows a correlation between degenerative heart disease, death, and the total fat calories that people uh, took in. It was this particular chart that sold the American government, sold the American people, got on TV and talked about this, that fat was bad, carbs were good. Unfortunately, as, as time went on and the studies come out, it was discovered that he left out 22 countries in his study that he had all the data for. What makes that even more of a lie is the fact that when you put the 22 countries in this particular grid there is no correlation there is no positive regression there's no mathematical formula that says there's any link to degenerative heart disease of fat and deaths so given the fact that that was interesting exactly about the same time uh, President Eisenhower had a heart attack and of course we all understand bad science and, and, and government aren't a good recipe for uh, good health. I think we can all share in that. Um, but interestingly enough, what we saw with Eisenhower that actually came out to be the truth is that Eisenhower smoked four packs of cigarettes a day, and by that time, 50% of Americans smoked. No question that we know a correlation between cigarette consumption and heart disease that's been proven many different studies many different many different ways so let's back up for a second and says okay well yep we were lied to yeah the sugar industry the government Ansel Keys a bunch of these people all brought us to a point now where this is what the lies have led to ladies and gentlemen we're at now in 1960, we're at 11% of the U.S. population was overweight. And at this point in time, 71% as of last April, 71% of the U.S. population is now overweight. That's not, that's, not a, that's not any type of a scientific curve. That's a hockey stick. So 
when we take a look at what's going to be our cost, what's going to, outside of human life, what's really going to be the, the cost and the pressure on our economy, pressure on our health care system, it looks like right here, just the obesity alone, obesity-related diseases, $340 billion. Where are we going to get the money to pay that? If you take a look below here, we're also seeing right here, we've got, we've got so many people who have type 2 diabetes now that we all understand that's quite an epidemic. We've now seen insurance rates, just an article my partner Rob showed me the other day, that there are states that are having hundreds of percent of increase in insurance premiums based on we don't care what diseases or what what chronic condition you were in in the past we're going to insure everybody so at that point the question is not do we have the right system in place the question is what do we really do about it that takes pressure off that system regardless of what system that is this is kind of a fun map as you can see, this is a map of a, uh, this is an obesity map in 1985, and you can see the legend there. Uh, there's a lot of states we didn't have any data on, but there's a number of states that had less than 10 percent of a BMI, and nowhere in the United States do we have uh, a state reporting BMIs over 14 percent. So hope everybody's sitting down for this one. This is where we were in 2010. So we've gone from a population in 1985, obese population where we had all blue, to a population where everybody can see this dark red, where that represents BMIs over 30 percent. Uh, one of our science board members, Dr. Paul Winterton, he's an orthopedic surgeon. He basically now refuses to operate uh, on people with BMIs over 35 until they have lost significant weight in, in order to bring them to a point where uh, a knee replacement or a joint replacement will even take and hold. So almost in every area, every facet of life, Obesity is really having an impact uh, on on our country and and on our population. So back when Ansel Keys uh, gave us this uh, grandeur report that fat's bad and carbs are good, along came the McGovern report, which essentially led to the creation of the FDA food pyramid. And at that at the if you take a look at the bottom of that food pyramid, what is it? It's nothing but sugar and carbs. What is it at the very top of that pyramid is fats and oils. So again, giving us the depiction, carbs are good, fats are bad. Carbs form the basis, and here's how many you should eat a day, between 6 and 11 portions a day. So at this point, we had kind of been sold down the river and what is interesting, ladies and gentlemen, is it's this particular FDA food pyramid that led to the center aisle of the grocery store, and all of us on this call know what's down that center aisle of the grocery store. It's processed foods, bad nutrition, lots of sugar, lots of carbs, and that is part, partly what has led to going from 11.5% in 1960 to a 71% epidemic in 2016. So in honor of our uh, voting today, and I'm, I'm happy all of you have uh, voted and at least uh, a, a lot of you have come out to uh, listen to me uh, rattle on here tonight. I appreciate that. But there is a lot of people who do not recognize steel that we have a obesity epidemic. In fact, in a lot of circles, people are calling it an obesity pandemic. And this is not confined, by the way, to the United States. This is actually now worldwide. And one of the best things we ever did, of course, is export the Western diet. So 
the, the, the world is now suffering from some of the major catastrophic illnesses that we are suffering from and some of the same epidemic uh, proportions of obesity, overweight, type 2 diabetes. Um, in fact, one of the uh, countries that is looking to uh, take on Kegenics as, a, as an entire country is the United Arab Emirates. And I don't know if anybody on the call knows how bad their health is, but they are they are close to us in terms of obesity rates, but they do exceed per capita our type 2 diabetes rate, if you can imagine. So overall, this is not just a U.S. problem. This is a world population problem. And one of the things that's, that it's at the core of this that I can talk to is that we want to help it. We want to do something about this. We can't just sit by. Now that we understand we can help, what do we need to do to help? So let's just take a little step back for a second. I don't know if any of you know this, but let's ask another question because, you know, we're good at asking questions tonight. And the next question might be, how long have we known that carbs cause people to store fat and that fats are essential for clean energy production and natural health. How long have we known that? Well, you know, Emmett Densmore, he knew it in 1892. He actually published a book called How Nature Cures. And the natural, the natural food of man. And if you can read that, that area in orange, an obese person may be given a diet of meat excluding bread and potatoes. That was the mainstay of the carbs at that time. And the patient will reduce his normal weight. So Emmett Densmore knew back in 1892 that reducing carbs reduced weight. And then he also observed that as soon as they started eating that carb diet again, they gained the weight back. A lot of this has to do with the seasonality of carbohydrate uh, uh, foraging. And so when we used to not have availability of the center, center aisle of a grocery store, we would have seasonal fruits, seasonal vegetables, seasonal carbs. And in fact, those are the periods where we would overeat those. That's where the insulin would help us store those. And we would store that fat for the coming months when which we didn't have availability of that carbohydrate. One of the more popular uh, dietary uh, trends right now is in fact seasonal eating, is in fact intermittent fasting, and in fact our uh, friend uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Densmore knew that back in uh, 1892. So here's another guy that, that kind of knew that and uh, he wrote this back in uh, journal of uh, uh, New, the New England Journal of Medicine in, in 1953, uh, where he said one one half pound or more of meat with fat, and you can eat all you want. Most of the meat you buy is not fat enough, so you need to add extra fat. Well, he knew it, so Dr. Pennington knew it. Dr. Densmore knew that. And that was back in 1953 before Ansel Keys decided that he was going to publish something that was completely opposite of what science, science fact, and already discovery had made. In fact, Dr. Atkins knew that. Unfortunately, somebody beat him to it back in 1960, 1863 when, uh, when William Banting published the, his letter on corpulence. So a lot of the things in that letter mirrored exactly what Dr. Atkins had published in his book. And I don't know if, if most of you know this, but one out of 11 people at one time in the 90s were on the Atkins diet. That was the most popular diet of all time, had the most people participating in a low-carb diet. But, you know, William Banting knew this back in 1863. So what is, let's start getting into some of the science. So what are the long-term effects of a ketogenic diet? Because I'm kind of answer, asked that question a lot. Well, 
we evolved on a ketogenic diet. We evolved processing fat for fuel. We evolved ketones running our brain and nervous system. We evolved fatty acids that went directly into the muscle. We evolved without creating free radicals from the burning of carbs and glucose on a constant basis. We evolved. So how did we do? Well, we simply survived all the way up to certainly the 60s. It's questionable <clears throat> the state of health today, where we'll be. I had an interesting dinner with, a, uh, with one of the uh, research scientists at Abbott Laboratories. And uh, my partner Rob mentioned, well, do you expect that we're going to be 95% uh, overweight? in another 10 or 20 years and she turned to us without any surprise and she said we're counting on it that's exactly what's going to happen and so what we need to do is plan around that and see what we can do to help so even people who realize what is the trend that's going on they're trying to at least create solutions around that but they know the markers they know the trends and they see the fact that we have the challenges in health we have. But if you'll take a look at this chart for just a second, notice that every one of these biomarkers improved in terms of a long-term effect of a ketogenic diet, which really essentially means our primary means of producing fuel is through fat. So what do we need to do? The biggest thing that we've talked about and, and when we do research on developing additional products uh, and, and improving ketogenics, we still look at this sugar cycle and had a chance to meet with some research scientists out of, of Columbia and they were interested in ketones for a completely different reason. They believed that ketones could help break the addiction cycle of some of the more dangerous narcotics, such as cocaine, uh, the opiates, even methamphetamine. But one of the most interesting classic slides that they showed us is they showed us the brain scan of somebody addicted to sugar versus the brain scan of somebody addicted to cocaine, somebody addicted to heroin, somebody addicted to methamphetamine. And the areas of activity that were highest was in the brain that was addicted to sugar. It stunned us. And so we've been working with groups that want to use uh, our product in particular, but also in conjunction with a ketogenic diet to see if they can break addictions, uh, especially narcotics addictions. I put this quote up here because we kind of believe this is a company where a good player, a good hockey player skates to where the puck is, but a great hockey player skates to where the puck is going to be. And my challenge to everybody on the call tonight is to help us and, and hopefully we can help you skate to where the puck is going to be. We see what the trends are going to be. We see what health is. We see some of the the uh, morbid diseases that we're facing today. But coming back to a little bit more of the science, here's what we do know. We know that the intake of fat has never been significantly associated with coronary heart disease or coronary events or mortality as a, as a reason. We also know that the intake of saturated fat also shows no correlation to those particular diseases. And what's very interesting is all the years that we've actually now been sold down the river on the idea that low-fat diets are healthy, low-fat diets have not reduced any of the fatal heart disease trends that we see in the country today. So let's take a look at it, and I hope this is not uh, this is hope is not uh, redundant for uh, the majority of people. But let's just review basically 
a natural ketogenic diet. A natural ketogenic diet is, is uh, low in fruit. It ha it, it's the consumption of low glycemic index carbohydrates. It, is, it has animal products with fat. Pasteurized, pasture raised is preferable. It consists of eggs, cheese, cream. Lots of those, pasture raised again. Saturated and monosaturated oils. No, no polysaturated oils. And we all lived through the trans fat era where we manufactured these, these oils that were almost undigestible. And those did, in fact, lead to higher levels of lipids and, uh, and, and LDLP. And then, of course, green vegetables, eat all you want. There's no, nothing stopping you. But a natural ketogenic diet, we call it keto one, two, three. And here's what that means. Keto one means one gram of carb. The two means two grams of protein. And three means three grams of fat. If your patients are eating one gram of carbs, two grams of protein, three grams of fat, they are eating keto. They are eating in a ketogenic diet. And so we have an ebook coming out at, in, in a little bit all about keto eating. And I don't have a lot of time tonight to talk about that, but that's one of the things that we want to talk about when we uh, get to the get to the conference. And so right now, let me take you to a review of the ketogenic process, if I might. The, there are four stages in the ketogenic process. The first stage is called lipolysis. That is really the breakdown of lipids into fatty acids and uh, triglycerides. And at that point, those can be either used by the muscle directly or those can be converted to ketones in the liver. The stage two of the ketogenic process is in fact ketogenesis. That is the process by which we are converting triglycerides in fatty acids into uh, ketones. That is called the fat burning mode. Stage three is in fact ketosis, but stage three is interesting. When we say ketosis, ketosis is a state as opposed to a process, albeit I've included that. And the, the state of ketosis is when your blood level of ketones is above 0.5 millimoles per liter of blood. We think nutritional or optimal ketosis is when you have a ketone level uh, between 1 and 3 millimoles per liter of blood. And what that really is doing that, that makes a, a, a big difference and why that's important is that as we move into a ketogenic state, um, we're going to want ketones going to the brain because the brain has a very high affinity for ketones, as does the heart, neurological tissue, and the kidneys. Those particular organs significantly thrive on it. And once the body understands it has a constant source of ketones, it will allow itself to utilize as much as 70% of its fuel based on a ketone regimen. If we need 30% from glucose, but interestingly enough, there are 58 different pathways where we can actually create glucose, and even the glycerol backbone of the fat can be used to uh, produce uh, glucose, and that is plenty enough to feed the brain as well as handle some of the other uh, muscle issues as well as red blood cell it, uh, building. The last phase in the ketogenic process is the most important phase, but we don't talk about it as much as we should. It's called ketolysis, the actual utilization of ketones by our mitochondria. A lot of, a lot of research is, right, is now being done, and we are looking into it ourselves, about the fact that beta-hydroxybutyrate, one of the major ketones, is very, very uh, instrumental in affecting what they call PUMP2 in the mitochondria. And pump one, by the way, is the, is the fat storage pump. Pump two is interesting, the, produ the energy production pump. So the more we start and study 
what's going on in our mitochondria, the more we understand the role ketones play as a primary fuel in those particular cells. So getting back to a little bit of a trend here, we see a major trend starting and I don't know if it's as much a uh, low carb diet because you know we have a lot of fractional people out there. We have the low carb dieters, we have the paleo people, we have the ketogenic people, but we have a big rebellion going on right now against sugar. And I think that trend will continue to grow. And I, I notice here I have 67 percent of the US population is overweight and interestingly enough as of April that's 71 percent. But right now to show you the size of this trend, right now there are 16 million people some way, shape, or form trying to utilize a low-carb diet. And that trend we see on the internet and from what we're seeing in our cells data is continuing to grow. So with all of that in front of us, I guess the next question, because we're all we're asking questions tonight, why aren't more people utilizing their fat burning engine? and instead of using their sugar burning engine. Well, first of all, we've been we've been brainwashed into understanding fats bad, carbs are good, but beyond that, sugar's addictive, carbs are addictive. And so what ends up happening in order for somebody to get converted from being in a complete carb burning sugar burning state and utilizing that engine and all its machinery to completely flipping the switch metabolically to now going into the fat burning engine, that takes some machinery changes. And so when people go from a uh, glycolytic diet to a ketogenic diet, what happens is they get hypoglycemic. And hypoglycemia generally reflects it itself into something called the keto flu. It really functionally feels like you are you you have the flu. Um, I didn't say this at the very beginning, but I've been in a ketogenic lifestyle myself for three years now. And when I first converted from a glycolytic lifestyle to a ketogenic lifestyle, it was painful because I tried it without the assistance of our technology, and it literally take took weeks and you just didn't feel very well during that week and had I really not been doing it for kind of scientific purposes I may have not done it. So the next part of this is what has to happen in particular for people to convert to a ketogenic state? Well there's a lot of enzymes and a lot of change of machinery that has to happen in the mitochondria that's been hammered by carbs and sugar for all these years for fuel, there's a lot of people who, as you guys know out there, are insulin insensitive or who might have metabolic syndrome or might have type 2 diabetes. They might have a runaway pancreas. But the point is their cells have been so bombarded with carbohydrates, they become insensitive to insulin and their ability to process those carbohydrates. Well. What happens when that happens is that all of a sudden you've reduced your metabolic rate capability and we see this all the time. So when people are converting from a fat burning engine to a fat burning engine from a glycolytic engine, there's changes that have to place but one of the major elements to our product is the fact that we invented Kigenics around the idea that we can completely ameliorate the effects of the keto flu and make that transition completely painless. And the reason we can do that is that we can substitute bioidentical ketones into somebody's blood followed with our particular area of, pre, of keto, uh, ketone precursors that continue that process and jumpstart that ketogenic process. So stepping back and, and saying, well, I mean, that's great, Gary, but why would somebody want to do that? Well, let's take a look at just a few of the benefits of, of ketones that 
that have been scientifically proven to impact obesity and chronic disease. Obviously at the top we're talking obesity a little bit tonight, but more importantly we're looking at improved brain function as being something uh, very spectacular that can happen. Neuroprotection for the brain. We're in talks with uh, people on TBI. Energy optimization. Ketones have far more energy than, than glucose. Glucose control. We're talking obviously type 2 diabetes. And of course, my fourth question I asked earlier, do you want to live longer? So when you're producing a, when you're producing a lot less um, free radicals, you are cutting down on that aging process, as we all know. I'd love to get into cancer because we could talk all night about that, but just a, a short note, cancer cells don't do well trying to process ketones for fuel. So let me introduce a product we, uh, first of its kind, that we invented, utilizing uh, the uh, technology invention by Dr. Dominic D'Agostino that we actually then engineered into a, a product. It's called Kegenics. And it's a perfect balance of electrolytes and ketones and ketone precursors and amino acids. And its goal is to help people achieve and sustain a natural fat burning state. So let me give you a little bit of an idea how it works because we get that question a lot and, and, and this is a great audience because you guys will understand that. So when somebody takes Kegenics, they're in, ingesting it, this entire pack. So what you see here is the exogenous ketones in the form of beta-hydroxybutyrate, which is the powerhouse of ketones. There's three ketones, beta-hydroxybutyrate, acetoacetate, and acetone. Acetone being a byproduct ketone, so we really don't count that as an energy molecule. But acetoacetate is a key in, in functionality in, in terms of the way ketones are processed. But we'll get that in just a second. So we introduce bioequivalent ketones in the form of beta-hydroxybutyrate along with, and these are associated directly with, essential electrolytes so we have a electrolytically balanced system because when you go from glycolytic diet to a ketogenic diet you need more electrolytes because you're going to shed a lot of toxic water during that process so when you're going from glycosis to ketosis there's a lot of shedding and dropping of that toxic water and what ends up happening with that is you drop a lot of electrolytes that with that you need to supplement those electrolytes into the system. So that's that electrolytic balance is very interesting or very important. Ketone precursors is the other part of this. So beta-hydroxybutyrate is going into your bloodstream and ketone precursors in the form of, of specialized MCT is going to the liver and that gets processed in one step into acetoacetate. So I'm back to that, that ketone. When the body sees acetoacetate and beta-hydroxybutyrate in some form of equilibrium, it actually believes the body is in ketogenesis. If it sees only beta-hydroxybutyrate, and now there's some beta-hydroxybutyrate salts out there, but if the body does not see acetoacetate in the presence of beta-hydroxybutyrate or vice versa, our studies have shown it shuts the entire ketogenic process down. So that's a very important part of it. The other thing in the product we have is we have ketogenic amino acids. There are four main ketogenic amino acids that we use in the product that actually are digested, go through the pyruvic cycle and then convert to ketones. And then at this point in time what we've done with this process ladies and gentlemen, is we've actually now stimulated the, your, the, uh, the person's body to start producing endogenous ketones. So that is how, that's how Kegenics works. Um, let me take a couple more minutes and then I think we'll, we can open this up to some questions. 
I've tried to do that fast because sometimes the questions are better than my talk and I'd like to get to those. Um, we have a very, very important vision that we want to share with you and we want to share with the world and we want to have you enjoying the passion that we have because what we believe is that we can help by helping people convert back to their natural state of fat burning, we can change a picture of this type of light bulb scenario to that picture. We, we are hoping that a regimen where we're using fat and ketones as our primary energy source will help all of the people turn on the light bulbs that have since been extinguished. So that kind of takes me to the end of the presentation. I hope there's been some information that that you may have wanted to hear and, and, and I've been uh, capable of, of delivering and at this point I think it's a I think we have about 10 minutes left for uh, a little bit more than 10 minutes left for questions. Hey Gary, let me ask you a couple here since I've been doing this. Now, as I talk about this with other physicians at our seminars, and, and some of them say, oh, yeah, I've heard about, and, and you mentioned it here, some other companies that have products out. But you're saying they only have the one ingredient, which is shutting down ketosis overall. Is that what I'm hearing? Nobody has a complete product you have? It's, it's shutting down the ketogenic process. So ketosis is a, ref, is a reflection of how many ketones you have. But what it's doing is everybody understands the term ketoacidosis, right? Ketoacidosis is when the liver is in a runaway state because the, uh, a type 1 diabetic is, is now trying to produce enough energy to stay alive. And so the, the liver is overproducing ketones. That state is called ketoacidosis. When the, when the body naturally goes into that state, you want to shut down ketogenesis and when it doesn't see the presence of both beta hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate the body will assume it's in ketoacidosis at that point in time it will move to shut down the ketogenesis process so unless they had a complete product like yours they could actually be doing themselves harm not good they they can use the ketones for energy john but that's just about it Gary, would you give us a sample, uh, take us through a day of what you eat in the whole daytime, when you take your ketogenics, etc. cetera? Uh, I'd be happy to. Um, right now, um, I'm, I'm right now doing 15 hours of not eating and 9 hours of eating. And during those hours in which I eat, um, I, I start with uh, coffee with heavy cream. And at that point, uh, I will take on perhaps uh, some saturated fats. And then about 2 o'clock, I will take the Kegenics product. And depending on whether or not I have an appetite at that point, I will take on a snack, a snack being a keto snack, meaning it has that keto 1, 2, 3 ratio. And then I eat uh, a keto ketogenic dinner around six o'clock, seven o'clock, so that I'm under that nine-hour window. Um, what's very interesting about that is that it's it you're almost forcing yourself to eat because you just don't have any hunger. Because when you're not when you're not eating endogenous fat, I mean exogenous fat, you're eating endogenous fat. So if, if I'm not eating something, uh, as some kind of food, I'm, I'm literally eating my own fat. So it's, it's always kind of keeping you in that state of ketosis, whether or not you're eating fat or you're eating your own fat. But that would be a typical day for me. Now, some days I'll eat more than other days, but I have some interesting rules. And one of them is I don't, I don't eat unless I'm hungry. And when I do eat, as soon as I start feeling full, I stop eating. 
And the other is every meal I eat or snack I eat is perfectly keto. It follows that one, two, three recipe. And at that point, this has been so easy. And I'll tell you what, I don't think I've ever eaten as luxuriously. That That's really, it comes down to I'm eating luxury. I'm eating things that I thought, oh, they were bad for you. And now I'm eating those as a regular, and my biomarkers are unbelievable. Does that help, John? It does, but it doesn't sound like any fun to somebody who's been on carbs for a while. It, now, when, when I actually read the instructions on Kigenics, I believe it says to take the Kigenics like 9 or 10 o'clock in the morning for, for a lot of people. How does that work if you do that? Those people are probably on a 12-hour eating cycle, John. Um, I've, I've decided that I'm on a 9-hour, so I'm doing 15 hours of intermittent fasting a day. But if that's the case, what happens is somebody generally gets up about 6 o'clock. That is a good time to take the, uh, their coffee with some heavy cream, kind of a fatty, fatty ass, uh, a saturated fat. And then after that, they can take the Kegenics around 10 o'clock, and then they can have a light lunch, uh, and then they can have a light dinner, and they've satisfied all their caloric needs, and they're very, very uh, satiated. Is cheese in the okay list? Cheese is a food group to me, John. So I love cheese, and especially you have to watch to make sure your cheese is keto cheese. You don't want to use processed milk cheese. Uh, because that has a lot of lactose, which is sugar. So uh, I, I've i started a new ritual at dinner, and I'll share that with you. I love uh, stuffed green olives, which are keto, and I love smoked gouda, and I like dry salami. So my appetizer at, at, at dinner is a combination of those three ingredients. And then at that point in time, sometimes... Once I'm done with the appetizer, I'm not even hungry for dinner. What, what tell us what the white cheese is? I'm not familiar with what you're saying. Um, cheese that is cheese that is actually real cheese. Some cheese is almost 100% fat. Other cheese is is milk processed. Okay, so it's made with skim milk. So it has a lot of of milk in it. That would not be keto. Is there a brand name or a type of cheese you're referring to that is good? Um, I'll tell you what, I like uh, Telmuk. I like the, uh, I like some of, the, I love the European cheeses. Almost every one of those is actual real cheese. Um, I like the, uh, I like Cache Valley cheeses because those have uh, those are very, very high in fat. And it's so easy because the even the cheese labels have to show you how many grams of fat does this have versus carbs and protein. So the higher the, higher the fat, the better the cheese. The, the other question that I think people would like to have answered here, um, it, this is a process of understanding and changing, and you're working on a program where people that buy Kigenics will be able to have coaching to help them get there and stay there in the patients too. Could you outline that for us and tell us how soon that would be available? Um, I, I'd be happy to. Um, wh one of the things that, that we see out there is there's, there's starting to become a lot of in information, but uh, as, you, as everybody on this call knows, as soon as you get something that is new and there's a lot of information, there's also a lot of misinformation. So what we have done, we started this last March, is we started building a coaching system to where anybody who decides to uh, uh, purchase Kigenix has the ability to have uh, free coaching. We will then take them from not knowing literally anything about uh, a ketogenic lifestyle or eating keto or eating naturally and getting back into that fat burning state, we will walk them through a series of coaching lessons and we'll, we have 
right now plan 12 coaching lessons that allows them to interact with somebody as they're going through that process so that they start correctly, they get the results they want, and they can move on to more advanced states uh, in terms of their health. So we're anticipating that to be uh, available within the month. Excellent. Now, the one thing we want to remind the doctors about or others listening, at, at homecoming uh, January 27 through 29, actually starts the 26th, you will be there, Gary. You'll have your booth. You'll have some samples, I'm assuming. You will be speaking. Uh, Dr. Linda Huxtable, a naturopath, will be speaking, and she treats people with your product. In fact, she won't take any patients, complicated patients, unless they have a Beamer, unless they use Gigenics, because she's just so busy, she handpicks the patients that want to get better. Is, is there anything else you can tell us that you will have available there, or things that they can glean from you at the seminar of the three days? Well, I think at the seminar, what we really are going to do is we're going to get into some of the hardcore science so that what we're able to talk about there is how do we help patients, okay? We can take different protocols, we can take different conditions, we can take different chronic diseases, and, and we, can, we can talk about the science on how we would want to integrate uh, a ketogenic lifestyle in tackling some of those those tough issues. And so what I would really like to do at, at, at the seminar is to really start talking the science and asking the specific questions of how do we apply this in practice. And we'll also have a couple of interesting announcements for, for your group as we come to that conference. We're, we're saving a couple of uh, gems for there. But at that point, the other thing that people can do at the conference is feel free to ask as many questions as you want. That's a great time to uh, network and mingle. And if you got a particular patient, right now I get calls literally every day by uh, doctors using the product in terms of, hey, I got a particular uh, uh, patient. Uh, here, we're struggling with this. What do you recommend? And so we now have, and, and for myself, being in, being in a ketogenic lifestyle for three years, I've almost seen everything and experimented my, on myself in just about every way possible. So I can tell you things that work, things that don't work, but I can tell you one thing is that we've seen a lot of success stories of people who have converted their body from burning carbs and sugar to burning fats and ketones and have had some amazing success and I could I could spend the rest of the night uh, telling you uh, of those types of stories and those types of conditions. Well let me just prime the pump here a little bit and just talking with Dr. Huxtable as I do frequently she says she has not seen a malfunction in other words dysfunction that does not improve along with other things that we do but her primary thing would be the ketogenic diet. Does that make sense to you? Uh, it, it makes total sense because I think that hopefully what uh, your audience got out of the, uh, the, the talk tonight is we are all about mitochondrial health. We are all about improving the function and the energy flow in mitochondria. And why that is so critical is there's no cell in, the, in, in your body you have more of, but that is the power plant. If you have a defective power plant, chances are something in your system is defective as well. So anything that we can do to affect mitochondrial health is where we are focused. And we're focused at, with that in terms of our own research, our products, and our goal, and that is, again, back to that vision of how many light bulbs collectively can everybody on this call help light up in the patients that they have. That's really our vision. One of the co-speakers at the seminar will be Dr. Mark Harris, and if you guys did not get to hear his webinar, I request that from my office there at Jason, 
866-338-4883. He's a genius like Gary is, and the two of them together are just going to light all of our bulbs up, and he has the science uh, unbelievably memorized. He's a guy that graduated from high school when he was seven, college when he was nine, and he was 12 or 13 when he graduated. He's MD, PhD, MD, and uh, he's, he's an unusual character. And uh, as I had Gary listen to him, he said, how many people understood that? So Gary has toned down his presentation when he did a short webinar for some of the doctors using this. He was a lot more technical, so he backed it off so we could understand this. But Mark has found using the product I developed called OptiMitoForce, it just capitulates the kinetogenic diet to increase mitochondrial resuscitation. So it's it's going to be very exciting to see these guys together with uh, Dr. Huxtable as well. And again, you'll be there all weekend, won't you, Gary, answering questions and, and showing samples I, and demonstrations. You know, I will be, John. And I think the, uh, the main thing is, uh, for anybody who's listening tonight, we, we can take the science as deep as you'd like to take it. And, that uh, is for sure. <laughs> he had my head spinning. <laughs> Are there any other questions we can answer quickly there, Aaron? Uh, right now, we're contraindicating uh, type 1 diabetes. And, and the reason for that is that uh, those people are heavily into a, a traditionally into an insulin regimen. So we recommend that that Kigenix, if if you're a type one diabetic, be conducted under the care of a physician. And weaning insulin off as you change and convert to a ketogenic lifestyle, and most people have thought in the past, uh, you can't be in ketosis, you can't, you can't have a ketogenic life if you're a type 1. To the contrary, we're seeing this reduce the need for uh, insulin dramatically in type 1 diabetics. But again, we caution that because we think it has to be absolutely done under a doctor's care. Very good. I know we need to to stop here. We've broken our rule to go slightly over an hour, but thank you so much for joining us. Thank all of you for joining us, and uh, we will make this tape available in the next 24 to 48 hours so that all of you get a copy of this. And Gary, we look forward to seeing you at homecoming, and if you guys want to know how to order Kigenix, they can just give my office a call. And they can get you all set up and, and uh, get going. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you, everybody on the call. Bye-bye.